there are a couple of types of wisdom that we read about in the Word of God. If you will look at me with James chapter 3, James chapter 3 beginning in verse 13, where James talks about a couple different kinds of wisdom. He says there, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. In the context there in James chapter 3, he talks about, he's talking about teachers and the, the stricter judgment that they face and the importance of controlling the tongue. And then he begins to talk about uh, the two types of wisdom there, the wisdom from above and the wisdom uh, that is not from above. So we have here God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25. He says, The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19, he says, The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. And so there is wisdom that comes from God. There is the wisdom of the world. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Wisdom is, is the ability to put knowledge into practice. And so tonight what we want to look at is, is the wisdom of the world and the problems with it. At least a few aspects of that wisdom. You hear a lot of people say that we need to live life to the fullest. And it's people with a perspective that is quite different from what we ought to have as the scriptures teach us. Uh, this, this idea that living life to the fullest uh, that is that everyday life, ordinary life, is just not enough. It's not enough. Uh, getting a, an education, you know, being raised and getting an education, getting a job, uh, getting, getting married and, and, and raising a family, and then you die from boredom. It's just not enough. There's a generation of people for whom uh, the idea that, that the scriptures present of how life ought to progress and and how we ought to live, it's just not enough. But is life all about adventure? The scriptures tell us no, it's not. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Solomon said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. God is our creator. Uh, Acts chapter 17, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill he said that God, the unknown God, the one that he was preaching to those uh, philosophers there in Athens, uh, he is the one who gives us life, breath, and all things. Jehovah God. He put us here. He gave us life. And as our creator, he has the right to dictate the way that we live. And he tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. That's the way we're supposed to live. We're supposed to fear God and keep his commandments. That's the reason that we were put here for. Uh, we're to work and, and, and eat our bread by the sweat of our brow is what we're told in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. That's going to be man's lot because of what took place there in the garden when Adam and Eve fell by transgression. We're supposed to grow up. Our parents are supposed to raise us in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 teaches us. We're supposed to grow up and we... We leave our father and mother and cleave to our wives. That's what Genesis chapter 2 teaches us. That's the natural progression of things. And then we provide for our own. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 says that if we don't, we're worse than an unbeliever. And then we, we, we take care of our homes. Uh, Proverbs 31, the virtuous wife there is presented as one who, who not only did she make tapestries and sell them, she bought a considered a field and bought it and had planted a vineyard and all these things, but she took care of her family and her husband. We're supposed to do that. And then we raise our own children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's kind of the cycle, the way things are supposed to progress. That's why God put us here, to serve him, to offer our bodies 
as living sacrifices. But we've raised, and I, and I say we in, in just the collective sense, that we've raised a generation of, of kids that, uh, and, and it's probably not even beginning with this generation, it may be even a generation or two prior, that for whom uh, life is all about adventure. And this type of, this description of how we're supposed to live that we get from the scripture is not enough in their eyes. And so you see this, this generation of kids who don't leave home. They live in mom and dad's basement. And they might work a job for a little bit, but what they do is they save up enough money to be able to, to take a trip abroad. And, and, and this is so prevalent, I mean, you read about it. But that's not the way God would have us to live. God put us here to fear Him and keep His commandments and to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Life is not all about adventure. Life is a, is a preparation. It's a sojourn and a pilgrimage here. And we seek a, a homeland, that, that inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that doesn't fade away that Peter talks about. That mansion that Jesus has gone to prepare for us, John chapter 14, verses that's what we're seeking. And Paul talks about being content with such things as you have. Uh, he talks about in Philippians chapter 4 that he had learned to be content whatever state he was in, whether he had a bunch or whether he had a little. And the love of money, I mean, the, 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 is, is the root of all sorts of evil, we're taught in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And so we've got to be careful that we keep the proper perspective on life. Living life to the fullest is not a daily seeking for adventure. It is a daily seeking to serve God like we're supposed to. And then you'll also hear uh, world, the worldly wisdom is, is that you do unto others before they do unto you. You know, the golden rule in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, Jesus said, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. That's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But this cynical attitude that so many have, that I'm going to get mine. And I'm going to do unto others before they have the chance to do unto me. Life is this zero-sum game, and there's a, you want a piece of pie that's big enough to satisfy you, and so you're going to do whatever it takes by hook or by crook to be able to get yours. It's a very cynical attitude, and it's not the way that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to love our fellow man, Matthew chapter 22, verse 38 39, loving God first and foremost with everything that we are. And then loving our fellow man, thats those are the two great commandments, Jesus said. And we're supposed to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, and we're supposed to even love our enemies. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And so that's the, the godly attitude to have. The worldly wisdom says do unto others before they get the chance to do unto you. But this is, again, it, it is cynicism. It's a very cynical attitude. And that, that comes from, from selfishness. It's a very selfish attitude. If you look at Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, notice what the Apostle Paul says there as he gives the Romans instructions about how to live their lives. Romans chapter 12, and beginning in verse 18. He says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul tells us, <coughs> Beginning in verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That is one of the great challenges of, of Christianity, is to come out of self and to be able to recognize the needs of others and to have genuine care and concern and love for our fellow man so that we would be able to put their interests first. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 35, as Paul there 
uh, gave his um, final remarks there to the Ephesian elders. He says in verse 35 of Acts chapter 20, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's the proper attitude. Not do unto others before they do unto you, but love your fellow man and look out for his interests and put his interests ahead of your own. And the old saying is <clears throat> that you shouldn't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. But that's kind of been turned on its head by worldly wisdom, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. You know, I'll, I'll live my life the way that I want to, and I'll sow my wild oats, and I'll do what I want to do, and then maybe one of these days, if I get around to it, I'll worry about spiritual things. Why do today what you can put off until tomorrow? Procrastination gets you lost. <clears throat> we understand that in a worldly, uh, in, a, in a physical sense. When it comes to physical matters, Proverbs 10 and verse 5, the wise man said, He who gathers crops in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. Proverbs 13 and verse 4, the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. You get after it while you have the chance. Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. <laughs> Verse 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man can't be a procrastinator if you expect to make it physically. And the same thing is true spiritually. We cannot procrastinate. Again, God is our creator. And he has the right and the expectation that we ought to be obedient as his creation. Acts chapter 24. Turn with you to Acts the 24th chapter where we read about Felix and his procrastination. We'll start in verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and, hold him, and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Priscilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Go away, and when I've got a convenient time, I'll call for you. And the record does not reflect that a convenient time ever came. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We live in the last days. Acts chapter 2. When Peter preached that first gospel sermon, that was the, the point that he was making was that, is that these are the last days. This is the last dispensation, this Christian dispensation. Verse 16, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, etc. As he quotes there from Joel chapter 2. We live in the last days. God draws us by his word. John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. We can't come to God unless he draws us. And when we hear and learn from God, we come to Jesus. That's what Jesus said. The Great Commission has been given. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark chapter 16 and verses 15 and 16. The Great Commission has been given. The gospel is being preached throughout the world. And the day of salvation is now. 
There is no room for procrastination. There's no time for it. Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Turn to James, the fourth chapter. James chapter 4. Verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, or what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. We're not guaranteed any set amount of time on this earth. And so we need to take advantage of the time that God has given us and don't procrastinate spiritually. We can't procrastinate physically, you understand that. We don't need to procrastinate spiritually either. And then finally, you only live once. That's the world's wisdom. They used to say YOLO and there were like bracelets and shirts and everything else. I think that's finally passed away. They don't say that anymore. But this idea that you only live once is, is what many people use since their philosophy is they live life from day to day. And because you only live once, and it kind of ties back into the first thing we talked about, living life to the fullest, you only live once and so you need to satisfy yourself while you're here. <clears throat> and that might be a true statement except for the fact that there's a resurrection. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, you'll remember that David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he sent her husband, Uriah the Hittite, to the front lines of battle and had him the army dropped back from him, so he was killed. He murdered him. Well, Bathsheba, and that's because Bathsheba was pregnant. He had called Uriah back and was going to try to cover it up, but it didn't work, so he had him murdered. Well, God was displeased with what he had done. And the child that was the result of their adultery, part of that punishment was that child was going to die. And while that child was sick, David fasted and prayed. Of course, the child still died, though. But once the child was dead, once the news came, he, he cleaned himself up and he ate. And they were kind of curious as to why he did that. David said in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, Now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David understood that there was life after death. When our physical body dies, when our spirit leaves this physical body, our spirit goes to paradise. Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. It goes to, to the Hadean realm, the realm of the dead, either to paradise or to torment. We don't cease to exist. Psalm 16, verses 9 and 10. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory, my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. We don't cease to exist. Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 27 tells us, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. It's appointed to men to die once, but after this is the judgment. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. If you look at John, the fifth chapter, in verse 28. John, chapter 5, verse 28, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. A resurrection of life and a resurrection of condemnation, a resurrection for everybody. It's appointed to die once, and after this, the judgment. And it's because of that that this, this you only live once philosophy is false. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a problem there in Corinth, one of the many that Paul deals with in his letter, first letter to the Corinthians, is the idea that there wasn't a resurrection. <coughs> and Paul argues that, yes, indeed, there is a resurrection. 
He says, beginning in verse 12, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God and he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead did not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. He says in verse 32, If in the matter of men I have fallen in beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And there's that philosophy. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But the fact is, is that there is a resurrection and a judgment. And we are told in Revelation 21 and verse 8 that the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We will face judgment. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. Jesus had just given a picture of what the judgment is going to be like. It's going to be like separating the sheep from the goats. And the sheep are going to go away into everlasting, uh, eternal life, but the goats are going to go away into everlasting punishment. Verse 46 gives us the conclusion of that. And the word everlasting and the word eternal there are both the same Greek word. And so however long the life is, that's how long the punishment is going to be as well. No, we don't only live once. We'll be judged and then have an eternity to live with those consequences. That's the wisdom of the world. Live life to the fullest because you only live once. Do unto others before they do unto you because you want to get yours. And don't worry about spiritual things because you'll have time to worry about that later. And it's all false. I encourage you to obey the gospel tonight while you have the opportunity. You've been given this day. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. John chapter 8 verse 24. Jesus said, Therefore I told you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. Jesus said, No, I tell you, unless you repent... You will all likewise perish. That means change your mind. And that change of mind needs to lead to a changed life. You seek after God and you stop fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Confess Jesus before men. Matthew chapter 10 verses 32 and 33. Jesus said that if we confess him before men, he will confess us before his Father who is in heaven. If we deny him before men, he will deny us before his Father who is in heaven. Make that good confession. Because with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10. And to be baptized into Christ. For all spiritual blessings are to have your sins washed away and to be saved. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Peter tells us there is an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism now saves us. We're baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into, the, into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're baptized into Christ. And why is that significant? Because it is in Christ where we find all spiritual blessings. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The only way that we're told we can get into Christ is through baptism. Not because the water is miraculous, but because God said to do it. And he said that's what it will do for us, is put us in Christ. If you've not done that, you need to do it 
tonight while you have the chance, and the Lord will add you to the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23 tells us that the church is the body of the saved. If you've not obeyed the gospel, do it tonight. And if you're here, remember what Jesus, and you're a child of God, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 51. Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. If you haven't been keeping the word of Jesus after you've obeyed the gospel, then you need to repent of your sins and we'll pray with you and we'll pray for you and God will forgive you. Whatever your need might be this evening, won't you come forward and make it known while together we stand and sing.